Lauren Lyle, welcome to An Actor Despairs. How are you doing? I am very well, thank you. How are you? You are glowing, especially with your incredible interior design. I'm blown away. We just got to speak thank about you. this briefly, but those pillows are impeccable. Thank you. They're actually matching my new hair as well. I normally I, have I just noticed hair. that as, yeah. the, as you became bigger, I was like, in the yeah. frame, I was like, wow. I am. Um, I've, well, I've had to dye ginger for a job, but um, the the pillows are all to do with my like new love for interior design because I bought a place two years ago, height of pandemic. I bought a place in the moment where we thought we were all okay. We'd like come out of lockdown for a bit. And then I thought it was a good idea to buy something that was a bit of a doer upper. Um, and then it was, and then I had to do it up and it was awful. I absolutely hated it. But I do like, but I've got into cushions. I've got into cushions, the design and, element. And it seems like now the benefits are paying off. I mean, this, this podcast aesthetic is going to take off. <laughs> Thank you. And I know I'm delighted. You, you have your own, she's right. Do you do it there? Do a dare or do it here? Yeah, there. Sorry. I thought you meant like do a dare. I was like, that's a great idea, right? No, I should yeah, do something uh, like that. There, there you go. You can take that as well. But do you, <laughs> do you record it on that couch? On this couch? No, this is my new couch. Actually, oh. this is a new couch. This is only a couple of months old. But I normally do She's a Wreck. If I'm lucky, I'll get I'll get it in a studio. If a guest is in London at the time, we'll get them in a studio. Or if there's someone I really want that is traveling a lot. I had someone like Self-Esteem. We've got a UK artist here called Self-Esteem who's absolutely blown up on this side of the world. She was like the busiest person I've ever seen. And she um, was just never around. So we did it on Zoom um, a bit like this. So it's quite nice on a couch, isn't it? It just gets yeah. a bit more comfy. Totally. Yeah. And yeah. I, I like doing it in person too. So I totally, you know, but yeah. obviously we got a, a gigantic ocean in between us. So yeah. thank you for being here and, and your work and Karen Perry is so amazing and, and Outlander and, and you've just been crushing the game and I'm so thank excited you. to get to talk to you. And it means a lot for you coming on and carving out some of your time. No, I'm delighted. Thanks for having me. So like, you know, our, our viewers know we started at the beginning. Where did you grow up? So I was born in Glasgow in Scotland, born and raised there. And I I stayed in the south side of Glasgow, which I love, and did the whole proper upbringing where I would just walk around the corner to school and I'd drink really young in the park on the swings. And I did all that um, in Glasgow. And then when I was 15, my dad got a job out in New Zealand. So me and my mum and my dad we all moved out there um and at the time I have two older brothers and at the time my brothers they're a bit older they were at university and they'd girlfriends and had been out of home for a while so I decided well we decided as a family that it'd be fine that they would stay and, and I would go so I, I essentially became a bit of an only child for a bit and went out to New Zealand for what was maybe meant to be a year um, and my dad bribed me by saying we'd have a pool and we'd live by the beach. And now, no, he didn't know if he could give me any of that. He had no idea. But um, we got out there and we ended up staying for about five, five years. Um, and I did high school there and I turned into like a proper, a right Kiwi um, and lived by the beach and got really wow. into just that whole lifestyle of like being outside all the time. It's a beautiful culture out there, um, a real amalgamation of people. Um, and much more laid back, very like Scotland in terms of friendly. Everyone's very friendly and welcoming as a people, but it's much hotter. The landscape's quite similar, but it's much warmer. Um, and they're very unmaterialistic out there. They sort of things like, I don't know if you know the brand Topshop. Yeah, um, of course. Which is huge. It was, yeah. well, it was huge in the UK. It's it's gone it's never, now, right? It's yeah. just gone, yeah. Um, it never it went out to New Zealand for about a year and never really survived because they just weren't that bothered. And it's just a very cool, very independent brands and um, not too materialistic place. Everyone's into surfing and skating and um, going to gigs. And that was just really suited me. I, I never was very good at the whole. In Glasgow, you get very dressed up and you go out in town when you're quite young and you really like glam it up to go out. And then I suddenly was growing up. To pubs you know, or, or just to like, you know, going to, to different places with friends? Sort of when you're going out, like as you're growing up and you're going through high school um, and sort of finding yourself and you'd have things called the unders, which were clubs for if you were under 18 and they'd open the clubs, like they'd open like proper big clubs 
for 18 year olds but they'd open them between like 6 p.m and 10 p.m and everyone that was too young to go to clubs would go to that and you would party and we'd all obviously have a drink and yeah or alcohol and whatever so we were drinking quite young and then doing all that and then having a bit of a mad time for, sort of around about when I left and then I left and New Zealand was a wee bit less like that it was much more house parties and the beach and that sort of thing and um, so every time I'd come home to Scotland I'd spend summers coming home to Scotland um it was always really weird because everyone would be getting really dressed up to go out clubbing and wearing high heels and loads of makeup and it just wasn't very me anymore. Um, so that sort of morphed who I was, I think, quite a lot being in New Zealand and that sort of like, I don't know, like cool mentality of what it is to be outside and a bit more laid back and a bit more chilled. Uh, so I was there and then I after I basically finished high school there and then decided maybe I'll try and be an actor. Um, so you I, just, in, not sorry to interrupt. I apologize, but no, no. I, I only interrupt because I, I just want to. Before you know, when you when you were leaving Scotland, you weren't in acting yet. It had not started. Yes and no. I loved doing it. I was always like playing the silly little funny parts in the plays and things and the musicals, and I liked singing. And I would go singing lessons and whatnot, and acting drama classes for fun. But I never, genuinely, seriously, never really considered. It as a career. My dad now tells me that um, he remembers a teacher at school coming to him before we left Scotland saying, you know, she's really quite into this and she's quite good at it. You should let her, if she gets, she sort of gets a bite for it, you should let her explore it. Um, and he never told me that sort of until I, until I was sort of doing it and properly in the career. Um, but they were always very supportive. There were a few times sort of when I got out of high school and I was applying and it was years and years of like maybe four years of living in London where I wasn't getting anywhere that my mum said no well <laughs> Andy but I didn't have to do it in the end but I I didn't know that I wanted to be an actor at all I kind of loved painting and I loved in New Zealand I had an I was at quite an arty school in New Zealand and I'd paint loads I got really into that almost went to art school um or studied psychology or something and then the deal was kind of like if I'm going to apply for drama schools I also have to uh, apply for some uni courses and then I basically got into like a theatre sort of course I guess like do I just basically got into doing a lot of shows yeah. in London so I finished high school in New Zealand I sort of auditioned to come and be part of some shows in London the National um, Theatre right not yet no oh, that okay. was the National okay. Theatre yet that okay. was it was the Edinburgh Fringe it was to do a lot of stuff oh the Fringe print. is the best yeah yeah. So it was to do two shows at the Edinburgh Fringe and I got the shows. So I came over from New Zealand, moved back to the UK, finished high school, moved back to the UK and moved straight to London when I was about 19. I think I moved 18, 19. I moved and did these shows. And I was like, OK, cool. Well, I'm going to put off drama school for a year and uni for a year and I'll do these shows. And then I started doing the shows and I loved it. And I was like, suddenly you become, you like enter this world at the fringe, like, and you meet all these actors. And I was in a company of actors, of people that were really ambitious and good. And some of them became my best friends. And I got this real appetite for it being a, a, an actual potential job. And so I sort of just kept going. I applied to, I well, I tried to get an agent I did a drama class called the Actors Class, yeah. um, and I have to shout out to Mary Doherty, who um, was one of the like she ran it. She was the sort of owner of it. She was an actor herself, and she set up this amazing once a week acting class. And she managed to have a big showcase and invited loads of agents and people that would come. Um, and I luckily got an agent from it. And wow. then I started auditioning and started working alongside applying for drama schools um, to try and see what would happen. With the caveat that if you got a job, you would just skip drama school, you think? or Yeah, the goal was drama school. The goal was oh, like... you still wanted to go. Because I know yeah, in the UK, okay. it's such a... It's, it's, exactly. You know, yeah, totally. Yeah. In, in the UK, it's such a, like, be all or end all. In some ways, people talk about it being a thing that you should do. Um, and I, so I always, I kept applying and I, I then was auditioning and I was doing various things and I wasn't getting into drama school. I was getting really close every the, year. The like, RADA, finally, Lambda, yeah. you know, Royal. All of them. All, RADA, Lambda, yeah. Guildhall, all these yeah. ones. I was getting final rounds, waiting lists, getting told basically you are good enough for some reason. We're just not going to let you in. And I've been there. Often, oh, okay. Yeah. Being Scottish as well, there is a bit of a thing where you'd notice in a drama school year, there'd be like one Scot per year. 
Do you so know Amy I mean, Manson? But... She's a friend. She did the show. Oh no, I yeah. don't. I know who she is. I yeah. don't know who she is. I think. I think I know who she is. She was she in um, Beats. I don't know her British work, but she's in, she's in the Nevers. That yes. show. Yes, yeah, yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, it is yeah, something. Yeah, 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 yeah. So when I was applying for that, apart from the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. I would notice that very few Scots would get into each year. You'd get maybe like one or two per year. And it was almost like a thing where you were trying to fight against your accent, despite the accent wow. being your sort of unique selling point. So I ca- I remember thinking, oh, if there was another Scottish girl in the room, well, then I was a bit screwed because we'd be up against each other because they'd probably only take one of us, despite the fact they would take loads of English guys, no matter where yeah. they were from. Could you so, do British RP at that point? Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. 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 Could do could do the accents. They just they're so about authenticity sometimes, and of and about your own voice, and you're working so right. much in your own voice. So the year there there came around a year which would have been 2014, and I've been I've been auditioning and applying and applying for for drama skills, not getting in, getting really far, quite heartbreaking. Like really takes you through the ringer for about four or five, almost almost five years trying to get in. Four years, I think. How did you stay I, sane, if you don't mind me asking, during that time? Because I, I went through the same thing, but this is about you. Like, tell me, how did you boo yourself? <laughs> um, I had really good friends that were also doing the same thing. So we were all quite supportive of each other. We would do, we would all be auditioning at the same time. And then we'd be sitting around going, I bet you by this time next year, one of us will be at drama school. And it was this pinnacle, getting into drama school, this yeah. pinnacle thing. Um, I'd work, I mean, honestly, I wasn't sane half the time. I'd be working like six jobs, doing loads of different things. I'd be trying to do as many short films and various bits and bobs and acting classes here and there. And then you're auditioning as well. I had this agent, so I was auditioning. Um, albeit for various different things. And I got finally, uh, I got into, basically, it all came around, 2014 happened. And... I auditioned for um, a massive theatre production called The Crucible at the Old Vic Theatre in the West End. The best, and, yeah. Yeah. So I had, it was my, I think it was my, I'd just got this agent through this acting class. So I've been doing this acting class, trying to do drama school at the same time. All and, four years of, of that time you were in that class or? Yeah, I've been doing okay. that class because you kind of worked up and then in your final sort of, I think I've been doing that class for maybe two years. I think it may have been two years because prior to that, I'd been auditioning for schools. And then that class I'd moved on for two years and the final class that you do, you get the showcase with it. I then got this agent. That was really exciting. Finally, I've got an agent, right? If I'm not doing, if I'm not getting a drama school for the last couple of years, at least I've got an agent now. That's fab. Yeah. And then the first audition I did with this agent was The Crucible at the Old Vic for like wow. the smallest part in the whole play. But I was like 22, 21. No, I was, no, I was 20. I was 20. Wow. I was only 20 at the time. So I auditioned for this play, the smallest part in the whole play, but they wanted people that could have movement experience and I used to compete as a gymnast so I went into the casting director and she kind of we read the pieces and we I read the whole of the crucible before I went in and did the whole thing and then she went um now Yale Farber who's a really prolific director she really wants girls that can move do you have experience and I was like yeah yeah I did gymnastics for 10 years and she was like oh well like what could you do and I was like well I could walk in my hands for you or I could you know I could do some flips here or whatever and she was like oh okay well c- can you show me and I was like yeah okay I'll walk in my hands for you so I walked on my hands for her and she was like oh my god you have to meet Yale and I was like okay great <laughs> yeah <laughs> so then I met Yale and she had to do we had to do lots of convulsing and like the girls in the crucible are all meant to be possessed at one point so right the whole thing was sort of that met Yale did the whole thing uh the week after and then days later, I think maybe like a week or days later, got the call in my tiny, shitty little apartment in East London with my friend where like we had like a little strip for a living room. It was terrible. And I had my flatmate there and she was one of my best friends. And we'd done some acting stuff together and got this call saying, you have got the job in the crucible. And I like pulled my top off and like flipped out. Yeah. And, like, ah. <laughs> and she told me it was like 600 pounds a week was more money than I'd ever even thought I would get to make. And I was like, oh my God, oh my God, I'm actually going to get paid to do the thing that I want to do. And she said, you got the this little part that's your own part. And you're also going to understudy the lead Abigail, the lead Elizabeth, and one of the other quite big girls, Mercy. 
And I was like, oh my God. And they weren't going to pay you extra for that? They pay you like 50 pounds extra. What? In in the US, it's like, those people make 8,000 a week. Oh, no way. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, no way. Seriously. If you're a swing, you make so much money because you got to know so many roles. Yeah. I had to learn the whole fucking play. I had to learn like four acts play and i had to learn the two biggest female parts in it and i know i know the play well i can't believe I'm, yeah I'm, yeah I'm, yeah i'm impressed wow that's <laughs> arthur miller's tough man that is that yeah. is hard to do yeah and so and i hadn't trained really so i'd done a lot of stuff with this acting class but i was pretty like i was just like instinctual and things i thought i was doing um and we all had to sort of do a different accent we had to do a northern english accent um so anyway did the did started doing the play and like had the most unbelievable experience it was very intense um it was sort of six months from start to, from rehearsal to the end of the run um and it was mad we we really it really went to town 20 i was in a cast of like 24 of the most unbelievable most experienced west end actors half of them telling us stories about their time with maggie and um and um like Gandalf and yeah. all these things going, oh Ian McKellen and they're like oh yes me and Ian we traveled the world if they're all Shakespeare company and I was just and I, I was in absolute heaven with this whole thing and then as I was doing the play I had been auditioning for drama schools and I got a call at the end of kind of towards the end of the run saying I'd gotten into a school and my heart dropped and it was a school that I wasn't necessarily wanting to get into. And I thought, and I knew it was because someone had been on a waiting list and someone must have not accepted the place. And so I got their place. So my heart dropped when I got in and I was like, oh my God, I don't want to go to drama school now. Like, yeah, I wanna, you've been I'm working. working. I want to work. And and I'd, I'd sort of turned 21 in the job and I was like, I want to just keep going. And so I called the casting director of the, of the show of, of the crucible called she was called maggie lunn she's unfortunately died now but she was uh-huh. absolutely wonderful she was like a real legend over here and asked her, i said what do you think i should do and she was like i don't think you should go i think you should keep working i think you've started just keep going you've essentially just done six months of intense drama school training with this play because it's been so mad and you've had so much to do with it um so just go for it yeah so i just kept so i just kept going and then then i'm kind of got a couple of cool little tv gigs here and there and was sort of going for it, but I was still quite young and I thought I kind of still want to muck around a little bit and like find out what I'm doing and it's stressful, like going pursuing acting, it's you've you kind of have to live and breathe it and dedicate your whole life to oh. like, running after it and driving after it and being available to do it. And I was working so many jobs to support it. And so I heard about this National Youth Theatre rep company and I was a member of the National Youth Theatre company. So I kind of managed to somehow get an audition for the rep company. And I'd kind of heard vaguely what it was. And a a director friend who had done this weird little play with Matt Harrison, he was like, you should come audition for the rep. So I knew it was like a year long, nine month programme. And it was 16 of the best young actors get it and it was the sort of thing ian mckellen would do right it would, it was such an everyone name. was in rep yeah yeah, yeah. Bef- sort of before drama schools were such a thing and you would do three shows in rep sort of rotating them and it was free you didn't pay for it um and it was like very still, it still is right still is. Like yeah, national oh, yeah. theater live presents hamlet or you know yeah. right yeah, yeah okay yeah. yeah yeah so it's still free and you basically do you do four rounds of auditions like you would drama school, like monologues galore. And then I found out that I got in and I kind of was like, cool. Okay. I kind of don't really know what this is, but I'm, I'm signing yeah. up for, I'm, I'm going to just go for it. So I went for it and someone said to me, you don't realize how much, how many friends the national youth theater has until you're in it. And I got in it and I suddenly realized how much support the industry has for the national youth theater, because it really is, the sort of nourishing of the young talent that are coming through that are going to be tomorrow's talent and future. And we 16 were seen as like that year's most prestigious ones that got to get in and do it. Um, And it's sort of nine months where you basically just train with like all of the best industry professionals over here. So you train with workshop, they come in every week, like the Royal Shakespeare Company, the BBC, um, casting directors from absolutely everywhere. And um, they all come in and just do workshops with you and train you and you do movement classes and voice classes. 
And then you do that for about five months. And then the last sort of four months, you rehearse three plays and then you put those three plays on the West End and you do them for three months in rotation, these 16 actors. And you sort of end up doing your year of that. So I did that. I got the lead in sort of the new writing play, um, which we all thought was going to be a bit of a disaster, to be honest. We weren't sure it was going to be very good because it was always being rewritten, like right up until the, the sort of opening night. And then... It thankfully all went very well and kind of went down a bit of a storm. Um, And I loved doing it. It was such a mad play called Consensual. It was all about a teacher, a young teacher and a student. Um, And they have this one night together and it's whether or not who's consented to what um, in the grey area of consent. Um, So it was quite quite controversial. Ahead of its time too, yeah. Yeah, uh yeah. And it was really well done. And so from that, I got a lot of agent interest from really big agents um, because I was sort of with a smaller tier and kind of a starter. And I got a lot of interest. I was like reviewed very well in all the big papers. And that was quite unusual for um, being so young. And then I got a lot of agent interest. So I managed to get signed with a new agent who I'm still with. And then it sort of all changed from there because you suddenly you're in a new tier with an agent who can kind of get you in rooms that you weren't otherwise able yeah. to get in. They're the, the impossible ones, you. you know, the ones that, that most people don't get to audition for, you know, like I, yeah. I just did a show, you know, and I, I only played a supporting, you know, small part, but you know, it, it's the guy who created downtown Abbey. So it was, you know, like I know I, those people that you know got those roles, I just would never be able to go in for with the agent. Yeah. That I, and it's okay. That's where I'm at, you know. But it's like you. But it's it's hard because I remember say I remember sitting in the office with them before signing, and I was saying it's really tough because you're told as an actor you need to have your ear to the ground, you need to have your nose to the grindstone, your ear to the ground, and hear what's going on and really keep on it. And I was like, but how are you supposed to do that when it's so everything's so under NDA? Yeah. Everything's so hidden now. You half the time when you audition for something, you don't know what you're auditioning for. And it or can be fake get, sides. <laughs> yeah, you won't yeah. get sides, you won't get a full script. You're kind of going, What is this character that you need me to somehow come up with? And my agent turned around, this now my agent turned around and went, Well, you can't. You can't know. We know. And here are my pile of scripts here that we have. And if someone's coming in here wanting to speak to Sienna Miller or Bill Nighy, or Andrew Lincoln, then we'll we'll then have a look through the script and see what Lauren can have from that. And we'll say, hey, take Lauren as well and have her audition as well. And I was like, oh, right. Amazing. So you kind of have leverage because you've got big people and you've got Damien Lewis. Yeah. If they, want Damien, if they want Damien Lewis, they've also got to look at little Lauren who's not done loads because that's also who you represent. And I was and they like, want to please them because they want their actors. Yeah. Yeah. So it was like a whole kind of opening of a world where I thought, oh my God, this is like what I've not had access to. And then, for, I mean, for an act, honestly, after signing with them for like a good year, I couldn't even get a recall. I couldn't even get a call back for a single thing. So auditioning loads because they were like pushing me at every casting director saying, this is the new girl that's been in the paper for her good show and all that. And I could not get a call back for a single thing. And I remember calling my agent being like, do I need to shave my head? What do I need to do? Like, yeah. And he, John T turned around and he went, um, oh my God, no, Lauren, this is this is what happens sometimes. And honestly, and it was quite good advice. And I still think about it. He said, um, you just need to find a coping mechanism for what it is to be an actor, because this is what it is. And I was like, I oh, needed to hear God. that right now in a way you did not. Oof, wow. Yeah. This- you just need to find a coping mechanism for being an actor. And I was like, okay, so I just need to find a way to cope because this is what it is. And this is not unusual. This is just what happens. And so I went away and went back to National Youth Theatre to teach. And I um, like assistant directed on some of their courses and was doing that as well as doing about six other jobs. I was receptioning and I was flyering for shows and I was doing call, like phone call stuff. And Stamina wise, how are you doing all this? Well, I was like... 23 so yeah. I was like I don't know young and I was honestly I have I have always had like an obscene amount of energy and like I am uh, at times to my detriment like very driven and to a point where like I'd, my social life would suffer and I wouldn't go out as much and I really was like to be like to be an I was so like seriously dedicated to being an actor and I now look back and wish I had a bit more fun um, because I was just, it was, I found it so like, that's just what I had to do. And yeah. I worked really hard and I did all these jobs and whatever. And then um, 
into these nine months plus I was doing this teaching with these courses, I got two job two jobs in. One was Outlander and one was a job called Broken, um, which was this big Sean Bean drama. Yeah. And it was a big, quite a big part in the Sean Bean drama. And I got the call saying, you've got the Sean Bean drama. And I couldn't believe it. It was like the biggest job I'd ever got. And this Played is right after the- he he's over Game of Thrones, right? Had he done Game of Thrones? I think, yes. I think he must have been finishing. He, he, he dies in season one. Sorry, spoiler. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. This was like 2016. So yeah, he so he was done. Yeah, yeah. 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 All right, yeah. so he's big at that point. So yeah. it was like, it was opposite Sean Bean. And then three weeks later, I got the call for Outlander and I auditioned for the casting director. And I was like, oh my God, like got the brief through and I was like, oh my God, she's me. Like, I, I this is like, this is what I'm, this is, I can get this part. Yeah. Especially for the casting director. And I could tell that they really wanted me to get it as well. They'd had me in quite a lot and I hadn't been getting anywhere. Oh, they were rooting then, for you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, it, like Outlander, I was doing the Sean Bean drama or I was like, I knew I was going to do that. And Outlander, I just heard nothing after the first audition for about a month. And then I got a call saying, um, the producers want you in Scotland tomorrow. And I was like, what? How am I getting to Scotland tomorrow for a callback? And they were like, oh, no, they'll fly you. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is how it works. <laughs> this is how it goes. I yeah. see. Okay. So I had the most horrific audition process because then I went to the airport and the airport had protesters on it on the runway, shut down. The production called me and went, don't worry, the two other girls that are also auditioning for the part are in the airport. You can all get together and be friends. Oh, and I was like, my God. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so How then we that all met. Enemy number one and two. <laughs> I know. They were cool in the end. But we yeah. met and then they were like, we got to the cat. We like got on a delayed flight and then we got finally got to Scotland. And one of them, she knew the driver because she'd done a job with one of the drivers before. And I was like, oh my God, you've worked. The other one, she just put her headphones in and like didn't speak. And I was like, clever. And then they both <laughs> went in. <and> <laughs> I know. Little. <laughs> I know and I was like so smart I yeah. why didn't I bring my headphones yeah. and then one went in hugged the casting director and I was like oh my god what am I even doing here the other one went in and she was given more sides um, when she came back out and I was like what are the sides for I then went in last fluffed the lines called like the character that was supposed to be my husband my, uh, my dad's name in the show um, completely overspoke when I was in there, like r- absolutely ranted, and then left. Got back on a flight back to London. Called my parents, and I was like, oh, I absolutely messed up. Like crying in the phone, had a horrible time. And I was like, I can't believe I'm actually mucked that up. And I worked so hard and I mucked up. What got up the next morning and was literally walking to my flyering job where I was like going to pick up a bunch of flyers to like hand them out at the end of another show. Got a call at ten a.m. from my agent, and she was like, Lauren, that's a that's an offer from Outlander three season offer and i was like a three what? season offer out the gate yeah, yeah that is unheard of yeah so i was like three season you offer. must have taken more than your that. top off this time and i, I mean- was like what what no but i mucked it all up and she was like no i know i know i i i like i'm I, i'm so excited for you everything we need to do the deal so don't get too excited because these i've not done a deal with them before yeah the and contract like, part yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 and i was like oh my god i couldn't believe it um Did you run a soho then, yeah. house and buy like picantes for everyone yeah i was like wasn't even no i'm nowhere near at this point nowhere near a member of soho house um, <laughs> Soon became one, obviously, <laughs> as every fucking as, actor as does. De facto yeah. of season two. Yeah, <laughs> obviously. It's like so predictable. <laughs> and then um and then yeah, and that is and really how, kind of what how changed did your my parents life. react to that moment. Because you said your mom had a moment of like, you know, and then getting a, a three season offer when you made that phone call, they must have been like, We knew, you know. Yeah, yeah. well, like I remember when I got the crucible calling my mum and I could I just remember her going, Oh my god. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. And I could hear in her voice that she she couldn't believe that I'd got an acting job and that actually I was now on the train to maybe being an actor because that year, right before getting the crucible, she'd said it was the first time she finally said, Look, what about a plan B? Like, is is there anything else? Because this is this is hard. Yeah. And I was like, You can't say that to me. That's just gonna make me unmotivated and that's gonna kill me. You can't be the one to say it. So with Outlander, I think they were just like 
I don't actually remember what the call was now. It was all a bit of a blur. I'd stopped telling people that I was auditioning for stuff. I didn't tell, she didn't know I'd auditioned. And so I think they were like, what? What? And then I don't think any of us realised what Outlander was going to do and what it was like and how big it was. I knew about it as a show being Scottish. Did, did Sam, kinda... Sam know, you know, or you're saying like, because you came in on like season three, right? Yeah. Yeah. I came in season three. And so I'd heard of it because most Scottish actors kind of knew it existed because it was a it was a big American show that you could get. Yeah. Um, but I really didn't know much of the story and really much about it. And um I just, just don't think I realized like how big it was. And then they kind of you you got the job and you start going through all the process and suddenly like we're gonna go and film in South Africa for a few months and it's three seasons and all this kind of big stuff. And then they said, you know, we'll announce you. And I was like, all right, okay, you get announced. Wow. And they were like, we'll announce you around about this time. And it was like winter. And I remember. What year are we talking here? Just this so... is 2016, 17. Okay. All right, cool. Roughly. Um, end of, very end of. And I remember sitting in my flat in London and I had my phone sitting out on the counter and I was having dinner. Um, with my flatmates and I suddenly looked over at my phone and they hadn't told us the date that I was being announced and I looked over at my phone and all of a sudden my Instagram just was like 100,000 followers 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 yeah. and I was like oh my god oh my god oh my god oh my god someone knows and I like went on private straight away on my Instagram because I hadn't like vetted my Instagram yeah, you had images you, you, ah, you know, I didn't inside know. jokes that people don't get I just went through that whole thing myself yeah. yeah yeah and so I was like oh my god and so went on private did all that and then suddenly you're introduced to the fandom and it is like a, a door opens into this like enormous world of of fans and they're so amazing and supportive but it is so it was so overwhelming and this um, is before cameras had even rolled Way before, yeah. Wow. Way before, yeah. How I think did you I, handle that then? I think I had maybe done maybe a week. I don't even know if I had done anything yet. I'd maybe done a read through for it and I'd met my husband, Cesar, who plays my husband, and we never chemistry read. They just were really lucky. Wait, sorry, we... for the you mean your husband in the show or your real yeah, husband? Yes, sorry, yes, oh, no, okay. we're not. Actually, no. <laughs> <laughs> you sold that so naturally. I was like, oh, I know. <laughs> no, no, no. But I met him. And, yeah. you know, we'd met and we kind of were all excited because we were like, oh, my God, we're about to embark on this big thing. Um, and then, yeah, we got announced and it was mad. It was mad. And then we went off to South Africa and then you kind of start to canvas roll and then it all comes out and it was mad. And then from then on, was it, I was, it, I've, I've been an actor only since. I haven't had to do another job. Was it weird kind of having the inverse thing where, you know, so many of these British shows, they're so profound there. And, and you know, the same thing happens in America. They're big here, but they don't cross the pond. But having being, you know, booked a gig on one that was big overseas. Like, was it bigger in America, you think, than in the UK? Yes, it was huge. Yeah, at that point, especially. Yeah. It's now gotten bigger here because I think it's gone on to Netflix and it's Streaming. just, grown. as a show, it's yeah. just grown and grown. And we're on season i mean we just finished season six has just come out um so yeah america was much bigger so even still when i go to america i get recognized loads i bet whereas in the uk it's not as much as like when you go to scotland you, i get recognized loads because americans and lots of scots watch it but like people find it absolutely mad that they see and you're a hero you know yeah yeah and that's quite weird um but america certainly like more and more with every trip i do in america more and more i get recognized um, which is quite weird. And here I do hear, but just not in the same way. Um, it's definitely bigger and has always been in the US. And a lot of the fans we meet are US fans or Argentinian or Brazilian. Yeah, um, international, you know, especially yeah. those like fan conventions. That's where they, totally. you know, that's so yeah. then obviously you have this incredible experience at the National Theater and you have all this amazing theater experience. You do a this Sean Bean drama, you know, and, and you get some you know, would you say that's your first big production experience? Like John Bean one, yeah, that was the biggest yeah. part I've done. Yeah. So, so I've done that, a whole let's say episode. I'd done like a soap episode, but I had no idea what I was doing at that point. The Sean Bean was like I was like a fairly big part in it as well. So yeah. But but then you go to Outlander, which is a show where there's no shortage of money. Whatever they need to make happen logistically, production, they can do. 
Yeah. How did that feel to find your footing on a show that big? I mean, it is unreal. It is unreal. I remember walking on, I mean, it's like people talk about it with Game of Thrones as well. It's very, I think it's the same where they do not short on anything. It is the cinematic detail, the sets and the costumes you have like handmade to you, your fit embroidered costumes and there's like three of them four of them per dress so they've got doubles and triples because you're in mud so often um and I remember my first day walking on set and it was all candle lit they like really do that as part of their lighting setups and it was all candle lit and it was in the studios and with I've real never- flames yeah yeah real flames wow. Yeah, yeah. Wow. yeah yeah and I'd never been in studios before I'd never been in like big stages we were on big stages And it was dark. And I remember just being like, where the fuck am I supposed to go? And then I had um, Nell Hudson, who played my mum. She was there that day. And I was like, thank God. So I hold on to her. And it was the sort of thing where you, I wasn't experienced enough to know that like a runner will take you everywhere. They want to know where you are at all times. And you think you're getting forgotten about half the time, but they're just not at your bit yet. And I remember being guided on to set and then having to just like jump into it. And I had to call Katrina Balf, who plays Claire, uh, I had to call her a whore on my first date, and I remember being like, "Sick, she's really intimidating. <laughs> she's really tall. She's like stunning, tall, and intimidating." And I, we hadn't had much of a conversation, and I was like, "Gotta call her a whore." All right, cool. And so did all that, and just had to like pretend I was like knew what I was doing. But I was so green and young, and I look back at like the scenes of the my first scenes, being like, oh "My God, I was shitting myself the whole time." And how did you it was fake insane. it? You know, for those listening, because like hopefully everyone, not everyone, but, you know, people will have some kind of equivalent audition or, you know, performance experience. How did you get through it? Uh, I mean, I think I was just like completely overwhelmed and like probably blacked out in my brain a little bit and just sort of got on with it. And I knew I was like, I knew my lines. I I just like watched what everyone was doing and tried to like keep up. And I think I like stayed quite quiet in terms of. I just did what I was told. I didn't sort of try and make an artistic choice or ask anything particularly artistic. I think I just like kept at it. Um, And gradually it all got much easier and was way better. And, you know, you you get used to it. But like we went to South Africa and we we filmed at Cape Town Studios and they had- Oh, I've I've been there. Yeah, I've done this. Yeah. For black sails or whatever. Yes. Yeah. We filmed on the black sails. Yeah, that ship is incredible. Yeah. I have a friend doing a gig there now. It's- I, I missed I miss Cape Town so much. Oh, yeah, God. that's how so I went to great. Nando's when you asked her. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Pretty, yeah. pretty, like pretty, pretty sauce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll have to go. Um, so yeah, do, I mean, doing all that, I think Green like thought that we would be um, like filming in the water on the boats, and obviously they can't film as an actual ships on boats. So then when we got to the studios, it was like on land boats that they have a gimbal and like you have to run you have to like throw yourself against it when they shout wave when they're like wave and you gotta pretend there's a wave in the water that was all mad so it was like the most unbelievable way to learn how to be on a set to be honest um and there's almost nothing you can't do after that because it's it's never going to get more awkward than that you know yeah you're in a car set the whole time and it's hot and then it's cold and yeah it's mad yeah so doing that was very special and then I've been doing that for a while um, and I've been really lucky to do other jobs that have been able to slot in between seasons. Um, and and, and got- that, I'm glad you, sorry to interrupt again. I apologize. Oh, no, but carry on. I, I, that was a question is like, when you got that three season thing, was it one of those kind of things where like, ah, this is great, but I, I, I can't do anything else. You know? I didn't think about that at all at the time. Okay. I don't, I don't think I was experienced enough to know that, that would be difficult and I don't think I I really didn't know what I was getting myself in for I really didn't know we'd shoot for nine months and of the year and that sort of thing you guys shoot nine yeah yeah we'd shoot nine months of the year um and so no I didn't as we went on it became apparent that that was that could be a bit of a problem sometimes like I'd be available to check for stuff or I'd know there was something that I should have got an audition for but I just wasn't available because of shooting schedules so that became frustrating I guess a little but then you're also like having a great time and so grateful and my part would get nothing but bigger on Outlander so I was feeling quite fulfilled especially by season five I had an amazing season five um for Marsley but then I got lucky and and dates like I did a film Tale It to the Bees in between seasons when I first started and which was my first feature film and then 
I did things like Vigil, which was a big drama over incredible at BBC done, Peacock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's done really well in the states as well. Um, and that was in between seasons. And then um, I've just done another film. I've just done two other films. And then can you can I've you talk done, about them? Or are they? Secret? I'm actually not allowed to okay. talk about them. Okay, I'm not ah, to talk yeah. about them. Uh, I am desperate. Then when, I know when that when that comes out, when you come back. Yeah, and we'll one in particular, up. I just shot, and it we we were in a very remote island, and it's with one of the best Lincoln actors in the world that you'd know her straight away. And I got to play opposite her, and she asked me to come. She was a fan of Outlander. And I know. I think I know exactly what job you're talking about. Oh, do you? Yeah, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. She was a big fan, and she asked me if I'd come do the film, and I was like, uh, obviously. <laughs> Um, and then obviously Karen Perry, um, which has been a bit life changing as well. So it's it's been a bit of a mix, but um, and how, how, all how been like it... partially luck and everything else in between. Yeah, but you worked really hard, you know, and and you 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 stay true, it, you know. Like I also have had to build this up myself, and have not mm-hmm. had any family, and have just been grinding and doing this, yeah. you know, for fun while auditioning and. So you you stay true and and you got your moment you got your breaks and and, and it's just kind of work begets work and and look at you now That's you it. know it's incredible and talk to me about you know Karen Perry what was that experience like yeah. doing I mean it's kind of a mini series more than it is a series right you know uh, well it's hard to, it's almost hard to describe I agree with you and the you didn't have family in the industry or anything either no Hell no. no. Same, I, I no. fucking wish, dude. You know, same. I'd yeah, call yeah, CAA yeah. and be like, I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. I same. Um, I have yeah, nothing like that at all. Yeah. So that is, it does make it harder for those of us doing that, doing it that way, and no drama school or anything like that. Like you have no like essentially no credentials apart from National Youth Theatre. Once that happened, not much credential around you. Um, and, and then so, even when you start earning credits, it's like, well. You know, so and so's got this, and you're like, Fuck. totally, yeah. And you, I, like, I'm desperate to do some theater again, and I'm told that if there's like you, and then there's someone that went to Rada, they're more likely potentially to go with the Rada person just because they've been to Rada. And I was like, but why? But what? Yeah, if, if I'm as good as them, why does it matter? Like, I can, I can carry my voice. I've done lots of theater. You're I can, incredible. Like, do you know, it's like, oh, come on, guys, let's well, get. They- Twenty first century. Come to Broadway. That's the key. Yeah, yeah. Well, you and I, I all have to do a play it. together. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but Karen Perry. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's been a bit life changing. So it's been unbelievable. That came through uh, because I'd done Vigil. I I knew the kind of casting team a bit anyway because they've cast me before. But they would put me in Vigil, and the producer of Vigil, he knew he was had Karen Perry coming up, and he was like, I like he saw me at the read through and was like, who's that? we need to see her for Karen Perry. And so I got the audition in and went through it all. And I thought, oh my God, a detective in your twenties. And she's a woman and she's quite funny. And she's re- it's really dark. It's really quite a terrifying story. And it's really relevant. Oh my God, this just actually doesn't come around. Like people are always like, oh, these roles don't come around much. But I actually couldn't tell you any other detect- female detective in the twenties other than Helen Mirren in um, Prime Suspect. Yeah. But way back when, um, which is not a bad thing to be compared to, but that you really don't get it. Um, and so it came through, and it's yeah, it's three essentially shot as three films. We were the scripts were called film one, film two, and film three, and it's three two hour episodes, yeah, because they're each thing. So it's like, so it's quite a, a cool concept, especially for how we like take in content now. Because you never just watch one episode of a series now. Like if you've got a six episode series, you always end up binging too. Totally. So you really get like a real rich world with one episode full of like twists and turns and drama and really get into yeah, the relationship. Yeah, I watch it. Characters. You're amazing in it. And Thank it's you. so great. Did did you shoot those like features then? I mean, kind of, yeah. We... It was so intense. I was in every day. I had a whole case, like the case up How on my long? wall. How long? Because that's so much. It was like, well, it was 12 weeks we shot for. Um, you guys got so... that done in 12 weeks? Yeah, which, yeah, three months. Yeah, three, almost four months, but three, yeah, roughly. That's think. incredible. Yeah. Um, the, I mean, to be honest, Emer Kenny, who'd been writing it, has been writing it. She'd been writing for three years before. And then they post production for a while as well. They post production for about a year. It was meant to come out earlier. And then ITV, the owner, ITV Studios, the owner over here, 
they loved it. They saw it and they were like, oh my God, it's so much cooler and fresher than we realized. Um, and so they gave it a much better slot. And that's like the September over here, like the autumn kind of hunkering down slot. Um, and then Britbox got it in America, which is like where Line of Duty was, which has done really well in the States. And um, yeah, it's gone very well. It's this amazing story for anyone watching that's not yeah. that doesn't know about it. Um, it's all about a uh, young detective. Basically, it's half set in the nineties. This like cool Two era timelines, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's like the train spotting kind of time era of the nineties, and then now, and in the nineties, there's this big party that happens one night with a bunch of students, and um, in St Andrews in Scotland, and it's, it's like where William and Kate, the Royals, went to uni, oh. and um, they all have this big party, and this young woman is murdered that night. And no one knows what happened. And these three boys become suspects. And then they just never solve the case. It just all sort of teeters out and they never solve it. It's cut to 2021, 20, 22. And a true crime podcast starts to investigate the case, a bit like Serial. And the police get a lot of heat as to why they've just never, they've just kind of let it go, especially with the current sort of violence against women and how much we've ignored it. Um, and they go, ah, okay, it would look quite good if we just put a woman on it. Do we have one of them? And so they find young Karen Perry, who's not done a murder case before. Um, and it's a bit of a double-edged sword because they know it's really hard to solve because they've not got much evidence. So they kind of shove her on it for optics because they think it'll look good. Yeah. And then she's got to go and try and solve it. And that's me. So off and we it, went. And away from the lover, you know. And away from the, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So it was a real different character. She's very odd. She sort of marches around. She wears sweater vests and bum bags and Doc Martens. She's not in a corset. She's not got looking pretty. There's no makeup. It's like a real sort of real woman um, that's flawed and funny and odd and sarcastic. And she, re we really acknowledge like the conservative nature of the police and how weird. And she finds it really odd and kind of like ridiculous as to why it's like that. And you'd all just the get over that. bullshit. Yeah. yeah. And if we could all just get over it, she'd get a lot more done and um, the misogyny of things and also just what it means to be a young woman. And she's got a sex life and she's not your average, um, like, you know, a detective is always like a divorcee and he's totally. got a drinking problem Alcoholic. and then he's going to yeah. solve the case. Yeah. yeah. She's not, um, she's not got any of that. She's really fresh and new. She's a bit like my reference was often um, Gracie Lee Freebish from Miss Congeniality pre makeover. Oh, yeah. wow. Very specific. Yeah. Yeah. April yeah. 1st, perfect date. To, yeah. <laughs> exactly. that, how was that such a fun time filming? It was ridiculous. Yeah. We had, it was a, the basic, they, they, they were able to cast whoever they wanted. There was no one cast because they were so famous that they had to be the name. I was probably the most famous person in it and in that, not even that famous. And so it's like weird that that even gets to happen nowadays, that you just yeah. get everyone that you want and then it's all quite exciting and everyone's really happy to be there. So it makes for a very happy set. Then on top of it, it was my first time really leading something. And on top of that, you're not only leading it, you are the name of the show. Yeah. So there's a difference almost there between just leading Number a show. Number one on the call sheet. And, yeah. And then you yeah. are the name of the show. So I kind of felt like I was hosting a party the whole time and I just wanted everyone to like, have a good time. Um, so you really feel very responsible for everyone. Um, I felt like I had... I really developed a great relationship with the camera department and we had a language where I, by this point, was much more technically understood. I understand what it is to be on a set and lighting more and um, even things like lighting I was learning about from our DP, Ryan. And we got to a point where I'd be like, the light's there, right? And there'd be another actor maybe that'd come in and was in my light in the wrong way and he'd like say something, like mouth something really random and I'd be oh, like... Oh, you guys had the it. shorthand, you knew. Yeah, and we yeah. started the plan, which is uh, really cool. Um, you deserve so yeah, it. Was amazing! It was amazing, oh, and everyone's you're so amazing good in, it. in it. Though you're so good, and it's so oh, fun, thanks. and it it's you know th those shows can become because there's you know the cop drama is is definitely a saturated market, but you bring it your own, and there's so much there's so much life and it's so yeah. different than you getting to know yeah. you now you know I, I feel like i just spent so much time with karen so it's so cool to meet you lauren and, yeah. and that's awesome and you know this thing's launching in america you know yeah. and, and then it'll go around the world soon i imagine you know is it, yeah. has it been fun on this ride doing the press yeah. tour for this yeah it's been mad it's really different doing a press tour when it's sort of um you your face doing the whole thing it's like right. you're not 
like you're not with Outlander sort of thing where it's like you're amongst a bit more of an ensemble cast like it really was me doing a lot of it um which I love yeah it was great I mean the best part for me really has been that it's come out I know it's amazing and I've been part I've had it in my we've had it in our pockets for I don't know a year and a half and me and Emer Kenny the writer have become really close and we love it so deeply and it's like our little baby and you just never know how it's going to be received and I knew it was good and then it's come out here and it's gone mad over here for it and the reviews across the board from like every divisive paper that they don't like each other they all like it um well, the guardian and the, and the, the guardian and the telegraph for yeah, example like they're yeah. kind of opposite and like they both love it and the daily mail loves it and um the independent loves it and the times and all these amazing big oh. big publications as well as twitter like twitter's gone crazy twitter's such a sordid place and it's nothing but positive oh, really um so it's been quite overwhelming and I'm, I'm about to go and do another film and my agent called me yesterday and she was like, just go, like, get away. It's probably a bit of a whirlwind and it'll be nice to get a bit of a break. But I'm ex- I'm really excited for it to come out in the US because I think a lot of Outlander fans will suddenly see my face on billboards and be like, oh, that's yeah. Marston doing and, something else. And it'll be quite cool to I, see that turnaround. I'm thrilled for you and I, for the audience. The reason I'm keeping it vague is there's a big red thing saying can't talk till 1024. So I don't like, yeah. you know, so I'm keeping it vague, but you're so incredible in it and everyone must tune in. And, and with this next film, is there anything you can say about that? Stylistically, tonally? Yeah, or, it, yeah. it's the next film sort of a very different character. She's very glam. She's really sort of very fairy. Um, she's she's um a bride, and it's a bit of a a bit of a survival movie. Um, Ooh. and we get to be in a tropical island doing it. Um, so that's quite exciting. And I literally leave tomorrow to go. Um, so it's a very different vibe, and it's um quite a heartbreaking script, but um also could be a bit funny. Um, but that's probably all I can say. Yeah. I guess. But it's wow. great. I'm excited. Well, you're going to have to come back when that one comes out now. Yeah. You've got so many amazing things happening <laughs> in the know. future. I'm so, uh, oh, man. Lauren, you're incredible. Thank you. Like This was so fun because you're just so charismatic and engaging. And it was cool. Just watch. I mean, I felt like I got to live your story as you oh. uh, you, you did my job for me. You know what I mean? Like It was amazing. And I know. And sorry. I, with my own podcast, you, you end up knowing what it is to podcast. So you yeah, start, okay, yeah. I don't no. want to take over. <laughs> No, I'm glad you did. It may, I mean, like I, I'm so, I'm, I'm so thankful that you shared so much, and I have so much gratitude for the work that you're doing. And, and I'm curious, you know, for for those listening that really identify with the handing out flyers and not having yeah. family in the business and struggling, and maybe having mom call them, and it's pandemic yeah. is coming back, and it's time to get another thing because acting isn't cute now, and inflation, yeah. and and Russia, like. Yeah. Any words of wisdom you might have, you know? I think the thing, you know how I was saying earlier, like I worked really hard the whole time and I took it so seriously. That was good, but it did make me quite unhappy sometimes. And I don't know that I needed to go that far. And I think sometimes it can be so all consuming. And now I value so much more what it means to take a break when you can and have downtime for things that you enjoy and go to the pub and like go to the go to a bar and see your friends and go on the dates even if it's like a stupid date if you don't have time to date go go on a couple and just enjoy yourself and have fun and go on holiday book the holiday because more often than not you'll get a job with the holiday thing or you'll just get a nice holiday so just do it and go Um, and you can tape now from anywhere so just I really now value that you you need to enjoy yourself and my work has dramatically improved and my life has dramatically improved now that I take conscientious breaks or meditate even a little bit. But I really think my mum's thing is honestly, it's so simple, but she really just always says, just enjoy yourself, just enjoy your life. And there's so much that goes on and life is so long that you just don't want to spend it. It's like grinding the whole Being time. miserable. Not yeah. Every, and yeah. even though you do yeah. have to, and there's not always opportunity and it's not as easy as that to just like go and take a break, but wherever you can, like if it just means having a meditate or having a cup of tea and watching your favorite show for an hour, like go and just do that. Someone once said to me, or I read it somewhere where it was like really hard work doesn't have to mean that you like sit writing in a room and like you get, you hate every minute of it. Like go and get inspired doing things that actually inspire you. If that's like go and listen to an album that you love yeah. and that gets you feeling good, go out and like, See a Go show. 
yet see a show yeah. or go on a big night out and like get drunk and enjoy yourself and have a big dance because that might actually make you feel quite good and that's okay and it doesn't have to be that you're like grinding on scripts totally. to be inspired that doesn't always really work for it me it doesn't have to be the Hemingway F. Scott Fitzgerald suffering no. suffering no yeah not, and if it, anything it's, it's for me not that and Some people that maybe works, but yeah. Well, I don't think it leads to any kind of healthy outcome, whether you yeah. know you do make it or not. You you end yeah. up very bitter, and and that doesn't work well in this business. And people no. se- sense that. And you know, yeah. obviously, you had just touched on it because you're such a great you know guest, and and also you do interviews. Can we talk about quickly your podcast? She's a wreck. Yes. So I have a podcast, She's a Wreck, and it is all about basically when I was sort of in my twenties, I suddenly realized all my artistic taste came from men. And like, I really didn't know my female influences, my women, and basically anyone that doesn't identify as a man. And I thought, I love a recommendation. I'm always asking people what to watch and what to listen to. So why don't I set a thing up where I get to talk to really cool people about the albums, the films and the books by women, or it's kind of developed now into just being about from people that aren't men um, that have influenced them in their lives. So I speak to like people like, Katrina Bell from Outlanders one, yeah. but you know, big musicians and quite famous. Olivia I just Cook, Olivia Cook, Game of Thrones, yeah, you know. House of Dragons star Olivia Cook. She came on very recently. That was cool because it was right before everything kicked off. So you oh. we hear a lot about what it's like for her right before it all goes. Kind of all the way along to from people like that to I've got a United Nations bomb disposal expert who oh. disposes remnants of war, and she talks about. I kind of wasn't sure. I was like. Would people want to hear from her about her music taste? Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. And so you hear about the song that she gets recommended when she, the minute she leaves a war zone. And like that night she gets out and she another woman recommends a song and they sit and have a red wine and glass of red wine and listen to this song having just evacuated. And this amazing story. Um, so it's just a great excuse that I get to talk to very cool people about their lives. And um, I don't know, you have people, I have casting directors come on again when you maybe got guests on this that yeah, very similar shows about. here that I do the same yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. We're like guests where they want to know what actually goes on really and, and sort of maybe put a more human meaning behind our industry. That those are some good ones, some of the casting directors. So um yeah, go listen. I'd love you to. I'd love anyone yeah, to. I absolutely will. She's a wreck, check it out. You got two anonymous movies coming out that we can't talk about that. You're going to have to go back about to shoot another anonymous movie. And yep. then Karen Perry, you're crushing yep. the game with she's a wreck as well. So I don't know anyone slaying the way that you are. You should uh, be the dragons next season. Maybe you might be. I'll, and, ask, uh, I'll, ask I'll call HBO. And yep. uh, I'm so proud of you. You're doing amazing. Thank you. Work. Thank you for Thank your you. energy and, and your positivity and, and sharing and, I needed it. And, you know, I'm still kind of in that, you know, not having fun, focusing, grinding. So this was such yeah. a pleasure. This this was a dance night out for me right now. Oh, and, good. I'm glad. These, these often aren't. So, you yeah, know, I'm thank glad. you for being so so badass and honest and pure. And, and I mean no, that just right. like unabashedly yourself. That's so rare in this business. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I hate that. I hate that part of it. Well, but that's why we get along. When you it, find the people that are yeah, good, that's yeah. really fun. That's and really good. I yeah. hope, you know, if you if you find yourself in New York City or, you know, whenever you're done filming one day, we'll have to hang and continue this. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ryan. Karen Perry, out now. So much love. And hopefully I'll see you soon. Okay? Yeah. Good All to right. meet you. Great to see meet ya. you. Bye.